joining me on the podcast is Sid Johnson, who is an associate professor of bioethics at SUNY Upstate. Sid, thank you so much for coming on. Good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a, a bit of a, an interesting discussion here today because we're going to talk about brain death and the ethics and philosophy that surrounds the decision to mark yourself as an organ donor. Sounds so, good. Yeah. So to start that conversation, I'm wondering if you could fill us in a little bit on, I, I believe, is it just New Jersey that has a different way of viewing a declaration of brain death and, and why that is? Sure. In, in the U.S., um, all 50 states recognize two ways of determining death. And one of those is sort of the traditional circulatory, respiratory, or cardiopulmonary death, mm -hmm. which means your heart stops and you stop breathing. And pretty much universally, everyone accepts that this means death. We, pre, every culture around the world, every country around the world recognizes that that is a way of determining that someone has died. In the U.S., we also have a way of determining death through neurological criteria, which is also commonly called brain death. And all 50 states have some kind of law in which there are these two standards for determining death, circulatory respiratory death, and death by neurological criteria. Okay. New Jersey is one of only four states that has some kind of accommodation law for people who reject brain death or um, have some kind of objection. New Jersey's is exceptional, however, because it specifically says that if there is a religious objection to death by neurological criteria, then death must be determined using the circulatory respiratory standard of death. Mm -hmm. And the reason New Jersey has this law on the books is because some sects of Orthodox um, Judaism reject brain death or reject death by neurological criteria. And because of the, the large number of, of individuals in the state of New Jersey who had these objections, they set out this one sort of religious exemption for brain death criteria. So um, if you have this kind of religious objection there, you cannot be declared dead using neurological criteria, they have to use circulatory respiratory criteria. And you're still alive until you meet that other standard, until your heart stops and you stop breathing. Interesting. Even if you are being kept alive by, by machines, so they're rejecting the idea that you're dead because you're still technically alive no matter what it, what's helping you do that. That's right. So people who meet the criteria for neurological death are in a coma, so they are unconscious, and they are also unable to breathe without assistance. So they require a mechanical ventilator in order to continue breathing. And so by definition, someone who meets the criteria for brain death will not be able to breathe on their own and will require medical assistance in breathing. So in New Jersey, even if you meet the criteria for brain death, if you have this religious objection and qualify for the exemption, you will not be considered dead, even though you require assistance um, in order to keep breathing and, and other forms of medical assistance. Now, it, brain death is not an exception here where it's the only situation in which someone requires medical assistance in breathing. Anyone who's in a coma will require the use of a ventilator to keep breathing. Right. People require all kinds of, of medical assistance in order to maintain bodily function. So brain death is not different in that respect. The difference is the extent of the injury to the brain and the fact that by definition, the loss of the capacity to breathe and the loss of the capacity for consciousness are irreversible. So the legal definition of death that's used in the United States is called whole brain death. And it means the irreversible loss of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Hmm. Now, is there any discussion, or I, I, I'm not even quite sure what body or, or government agency would dictate this, to have a uniform way of looking at both death and brain death across the country? So there's an organization called the Uniform Laws Commission, 
and they create templates for state laws. And part of the function that this serves is to create some consistency across laws around the country. And so there is a model law, which is called the Uniform Determination of Death Act, uh, which is the model on which most state laws concerning brain death and circulatory respiratory death are modeled. And so in the US, that standard is whole brain death. That's not the standard everywhere in the world. There are countries, Canada, for example, and the UK, which use a brain stem standard for determining death. And the brain, stand, brain stem standard basically is because the brain stem is essential for breathing and for consciousness. So this is a standard where both that capacity for unassisted breathing and for consciousness are permanently lost. But in either case, the, the definition or the criteria are met when there is this permanent and irreversible loss of these capacities. So is it, is it fair to say, or maybe it's dramatic, I, I want to hear your opinion, that in one state you could be declared brain dead and not in the other? Well, I think it's problematic. Certainly when we think about death, we think that we ought to be consistent in, in how we treat death or define death. So if you're dead in one place, you're dead everywhere, right? It shouldn't matter where your body happens to be located at a given time um, in terms of whether or not you are actually dead. Right. So if you are in New Jersey and you qualify for that religious exemption, then you are not going to be considered legally dead. On the other hand, if you are in New York, which also has an accommodation law, but not one that will change the definition of death that can be used in your case. So if you're just right across the border in New York, or if you're in Pennsylvania, or, or Florida, or, or any other state, you will be considered dead, and you will not be considered dead in New Jersey. Mm. One of the more dramatic examples of this happening was in a case that occurred a few years ago involving Jahai McMath, who was this 13-year-old girl who had a tonsillectomy in, uh, in California. She lived in Oakland and was bleeding too much after her surgery. And this resulted in significant blood loss and sort of an anoxic brain injury. And she was declared brain dead in California. Her family did not accept that diagnosis, took the hospital to court, and ultimately took her to New Jersey. So in California, she was legally dead. There had already been a death certificate issued for her there. In New Jersey, she was considered alive and her family had to keep her in New Jersey um, for the rest of her life in order for her to be considered living. Oh, wow. You know, that I was just going to ask you if there were any cases, right? Because when you're describing the border of New York and New Jersey, it's almost like, where should we send the ambulance or what hospital should you call, right? Uh, depending on your wishes raises a, a very interesting dilemma. Uh, right. So yeah. I, I mean, if you, if you live in New Jersey and work in New York City and, and happen to have some horrible accident while you're in New York City, you might be declared dead, even though in New Jersey, you wouldn't be. Now, right. they're close enough that a family could probably arrange to transfer that patient to a hospital in New Jersey if they wanted to. Right. Especially um, if you can come from California, you can, you can manage. Um, right. So as far as brain death, is there coming back from that? So the case I just mentioned, the case of Jahai McMath, is to date the only case we have where someone might have recovered. Hmm. By definition, you should not be able to recover from death. If you right. do recover from death, then you are not actually dead. Um, <laughs> Jahai McMath's case is somewhat controversial. Um, she did ultimately die a few years ago, but before that happened, there was some evidence that she might have actually recovered and might have even recovered consciousness to some extent. Oh so that would be a really extraordinary case and one we haven't seen elsewhere. Most of the time, when there is a, a determination of death by neurological criteria, the, the patient is removed from the ventilator and removed from life-sustaining treatment. So they are going to die one way or the other. Right. Um, it's, it's rare. It's still unusual to have these objections where 
the person will be sort of maintained indefinitely on life-sustaining treatment, but it does occasionally happen. And there are some documented cases, particularly with children who may be an exception because their brains might be unusually elastic and, and prone to growth and recovery. It may be that children are an unusual case here. And Jahai McMath was was only 13 when she suffered her brain injury. So it could be that, you know, something extraordinary happened in her case. Right. I want to talk about how brain death relates to becoming an organ donor. Mm -hmm. This is something you study as a, a bioethics professor and philosopher? Brain death is one of the things that I have looked at in as a bioethicist and as a philosopher because it's just really interesting to me. Right. Um, and then, of course, as a professor, I also sort of teach the ethics of, of organ donation. And there's definitely a, an important link between organ transplantation and brain death. Brain dead individuals are an extremely important source of life-saving organs. And one of the reasons for that is because one of the, the strange and counterintuitive aspects of brain death is that as long as there is physiological or medical support for the body, the brain is not really essential for the continued functioning of the body. So someone who's brain dead continues to have a beating heart, their body stays warm, their blood continues to circulate, Basic functions like digestion and excretion and wound healing can all continue. Those are not things we typically think of as um, happening with a corpse. Right. So the, the body, as long as we can maintain the life of the body, will we'll be able to keep healthy organs. And that's one of the reasons why determinations of brain death are, are often something that occur before someone becomes an organ donor or becomes eligible to be an organ donor. So, and that's because the body is such that the organs can be maintained in a healthy condition for transplant. Right. Whereas, uh, you know, if somebody passes away, the clock is, is ticking, right, from, from any other cause to find out whether or not those organs will be viable for another user. Right. If you were to to die, for example, you know, in an, in an accident of some kind and be an hour away from a hospital or something like that, it's unlikely that, that your organs would remain viable until really? they were able to remove them. Yeah. It's that, it's that short. Well, once the, the body sort of stops and the heartbeat stops, things will start to die. So, you know, although the organs themselves can be preserved on ice once they are removed from the body, um, and each organ is different in terms of how long it can remain viable and healthy, if, if you die, you know, too far away from a hospital or if you die from, from a heart attack or something like that, you're less likely to be um, a good candidate for organ donation. Hmm. Well, I, that's very surprising to me, and I didn't realize how, how quickly that the body breaks down, so to speak. What are some other things that you think about with relation to organ donation that you think people should know when, when thinking about whether or not to check that box on their driver's license? I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize when they agree to be an organ donor is that it's very likely that, that the condition they'll be in before then is is a condition of brain death in which their heart will still be beating, in which sort of basic bodily functions will be continued. I think many people don't have a clear concept of what brain death actually means and, and that it means that there is still a functioning body there um, and that their heart will still be beating when they remove their organs. Mm -hmm. So that is something I think people are not aware of. And of course, the way that we talk about organ donation and the way that people typically agree to be organ donors, for example, when they get their driver's license or get some form of state ID, is not a scenario where you're likely to get that kind of medical information about what will happen. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, of course, I think most people are motivated by the fact that should they die, they will have the opportunity to save someone else's life. And that is an important outcome um, when, when you happen to no longer need your organs. Yeah. So what are some other, other things that you discuss or 
uh, teach as a bioethics professor? Well, I teach um, all kinds of things that are related to bioethics. Because I'm in a medical school, a lot of what we focus on is what counts as good and ethical patient care, how to treat patients with respect, um, and different kinds of situations where there can be conflicts or unusual things can happen, where patients don't agree with with treatment plans or want something that they can't have or don't want something that their doctor thinks they should have. There are a number of different scenarios where there can be conflicts that occur between patients and healthcare providers where ethics and, and sort of ethical standards in bioethics can help smooth the situation or guide what we should do in those cases. So in a scenario of going back to what we're describing, uh, are patients in a state where uh, there is no medical exception or, or exemption has been declared brain dead, but the family doesn't want to accept that. They want to keep the individual on a hospital bed. How, how does that, how is that resolved? I mean, that's such a tremendous battle, I'm sure. Yeah. As I mentioned, New Jersey is one exception where the family will be able to reject that diagnosis of death or that determination of death. In other states, the only other states that have any kind of accommodation law, which usually just means give the family some space and some time here um, are New York, California, and Illinois. But other states haven't put anything into their laws there. How different hospitals will deal with these situations is going to vary. Some hospitals or, or some individual doctors um, will be much more dogmatic, I suppose you could say, about the fact that this person is dead and we're going to remove them from the ventilator and from life-sustaining treatment. They don't belong in a hospital bed because they are already dead. Mm -hmm. And others will, you know, provide more counseling or provide some social work support or some religious support to the family in those cases to sort of help them come to terms with what kind of diagnosis they're facing. These are, of course, extremely difficult things for, for people to experience when someone unexpectedly dies in this way, and nonetheless, their body looks as if they are still alive. Right. So these can be extremely difficult situations. There can be, of course, also situations where there are religious or cultural or other kinds of spiritual objections to a brain death diagnosis. And Legally, these people count as being dead, but of course, that's very little comfort to to someone whose you know very important cultural or spiritual beliefs reject that kind of mm -hmm. determination of death. So it it's it's it doesn't do any good to just stamp our feet there and say, "But they're dead," and you just have to accept it and and go away. They can't stay in our <laughs> hospital, right? It it would be good if we could be more compassionate in those situations yeah. and and assist people in sort of coming to terms with what has happened, provide them with sort of competent spiritual guidance and and so on. Right. A lot of the times in this podcast, I talk about like the the stages of grief and and that moment could lead to a lashing out, right? Uh, I'm sure you encounter fairly often. And it's something you hear about people attacking the doctor as if that person, as if the doctor was doing something to the patient. Mm. Like, Can you believe this, this doctor did that? So I, I'd imagine, yes. I mean, that is such a big moment where the medical staff is saying, all right, we'd like to uh, remove your loved one's organs and, and People just be like, whoa, 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 this is this is happening way too fast. Right, right. And organ donation is um, one scenario that can happen, but of course, not everyone who's declared brain dead is an organ donor. I mean, if that person themselves did not agree to be an organ donor, or if their family does not agree to donate their organs, then generally speaking, that's not going to happen. We don't just take everyone's organs because yeah. <laughs> they happen to have been declared brain dead. And some people actually do have those suspicions or maybe, you know, some, some fears that, um, the doctors won't try as hard to save their life if they sign their donor card or something like that. And it's important to know that, that of course, your consent to be an organ donor 
absolutely essential to to that process and your family's consent that you are an organ donor is important to that process and it's generally speaking even if you signed the card and if your family says nope we don't want this to happen we don't want them to die in that way then then the hospital is going to respect those wishes yeah no that that's certainly a fear that people will mention that like as if doctors are just dying to get your they want to get your organs <laughs> like some kind of serial killer like yeah, yeah. that is a, good, a very important reminder Is there anything you think I'm missing with regards to this discussion of, of brain death or, or organ donation? Well, one of the things I think is that's important is the history of how we arrived at this way of determining that someone is dead. Hmm. So for most of human history, you know, death meant that your body got stiff and cold and it started to decompose and then we buried you or, or whatever it was that we did. There are some references in some ancient religious texts like the Old Testament and the, the Quran, which also link breath with life. So for thousands of years, we've understood that death meant you're, you stopped breathing. And, and of course, now we also know your heart is going to stop. And that kind of death is pretty much universally accepted. Everyone understands that you're dead in that circumstance. Brain death is a much more recent invention. And it's fairly widely accepted internationally as a legal and medically valid way to determine death, but it's not universally accepted in the same way. And there are countries and there are also religious and cultural traditions that don't accept it. In the modern era, we arrived at this definition of death in 1968. It wasn't actually that long ago. No, that's not. And wow. a, a paper was, or a report, was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by this 
ad hoc committee of the Harvard Medical School, which was convened to examine the definition of brain death. And they were responding to two problems. One problem was a good problem, which is that intensive care had improved. And in particular, with the invention of these small ventilators, we were able to keep people alive who were not able to breathe. And there was concern that there was this category of patients who had really severe brain injuries, but who could be kept alive and for whom nothing else could really be done. And they were considered irreversibly comatose. But at the time, it was not legally permissible to remove life-sustaining treatment. That would have been considered medical homicide. Oh, wow. So to get around that, to get around doctors being charged with murdering these patients, it was necessary to be able to say that they were already dead. Otherwise, this concern is we're going to have our intensive care units filled with these patients that we can't really help, that we can't really treat, but we can keep them alive. And the other important problem that they were responding to was also a good problem, which is that there had been advances in organ transplantation and in the success of organ transplantation and therefore a greater need for organs. And as we've already discussed, brain dead individuals are a very important source of life-saving organs. Mm -hmm. So they arrived at this conclusion that there was a way to determine death through neurological criteria and that brain death was equivalent to traditional circulatory respiratory death. So this was a change in the way that we define death that was really very much driven by medical technology and by advances in medical technology. That's incredibly interesting, right? Around, you said 1968, 1969, yeah. we, we were landed on the moon. And, That's and, right. You know, one seems so much further advanced than the other, right? That like, we're, we're putting humans on the moon, but still wrestling with the idea or just coming to terms with the idea of brain death. Um, right. This, this was also a period, um, these were sort of early days for, for bioethics, and there was a kind of growing concern at the time about advances in medical technology that kind of only got us part way mm -hmm. towards the goal of, of improving health or, or saving lives. And, and this concern that there were people that we could keep alive given advances there, but we couldn't do anything else for them. And they were, they were you know, doomed to spend the rest of their existence unconscious and unable to communicate and unable to have meaningful lives. And so there was this concern that sort of medical technology had gotten us to this point where we needed to start thinking about the value of life and whether all, all ways of being alive were worthwhile for people or desirable for people. Yeah, I mean, that raises two, two things. One is that it must be excruciating for families to see a loved one for an extended period of time laying in a hospital bed with no quality of life, I guess would be the way I'd put it. Whereas it's so difficult to even say it, but like, whereas allowing the person to pass and begin the grieving process seems like a, like a, just mentally a healthier route to go for the people who are still left. I mean, but that's just obviously my opinion. People may feel differently. And I think many people would agree with you there. And of course, one thing that I think is really important is that we respect the wishes of that patient, uh, particularly if they were an adult who might have had opinions about these things, about what kind of life they would have wanted to live and what kind of life they would have considered worthwhile. And for some people for whom, for example, their religious beliefs are extremely important, you know, they're willing to accept the possibility that they might be kept alive under conditions that other people would not want. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. We ought to respect people's own subjective preferences about what kind of life they might need mm -hmm. to, to live. And, and so 
you know, there's going to be variation here in how people view what counts as a good life, what counts as the best kind of life, what counts as flourishing in life. And some people will say just being alive is enough, even if I'm in a hospital bed. Mm -hmm. And some people will say, that's not what I want. Some people will say on behalf of a family member, we know that's not what she would want. She told us enough during her life or we know enough about her to know she wouldn't want to keep, keep living this way for, for years and years. Yeah. I also see the, the side of the eternal optimist who thinks uh, my loved one is, is in this bed and, and there's advances in science all the time. What if I commit this person to a quote unquote early grave and then something's discovered down the road. So yeah, I, I do see other perspectives and that's great that the wishes of, of everyone is respected. Right. And, and I think that in some cases, you know, families will, will initially say, right, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep trying. We have to maintain hope that they're going to recover. And perhaps, you know, two months down the road or two years down the road, they come to realize, you know, this isn't going to work and we know this isn't what they wanted mm -hmm. to happen. So people can, can sometimes come to a different conclusion about what they think is the right thing to do, just given enough time to reflect on it. Sure. So being too hasty and sort of shoving people out the door when someone's been, you know, determined to be brain dead isn't going to work. That's not a timeline that works for everyone. And I think we, we want to be a little more flexible and compassionate in those kinds of situations. Yeah. Oh, man. The other thing, sorry, I had to take a breath there to sort of breathe all this in. It's, it's so interesting and and heavy. I, do, I also wanted to ask you about, what was the term you used? Medical homicide? Mm. Are there cases where doctors were tried and convicted for taking a brain dead patient off of medical assistance before this determination of brain death came through? I don't know of any cases where that happened, but there was the legal possibility that mm. that would happen because at the time we didn't yet have, at least in the United States, we didn't have the sort of body of case law that currently exists, which permits life sustaining treatment to be withdrawn from patients, even mm. if it will result in their death. So this determination of brain death sort of starts in the late 1960s in the early 1970s, we also had the vegetative state sort of named as a, as a diagnosis. And um, those cases started coming up very quickly after that, where we had patients who were not brain dead, but who had sustained very serious brain injuries. And again, doctors were faced with the dilemma of not being able to remove life-sustaining treatment from those patients without being accused of having murdered them. So in the United States, again in New Jersey actually, we had the case of Karen Ann Quinlan, who was in what was called a persistent vegetative state and whose parents requested that life-sustaining treatment, in, in this case her ventilator, be removed. And her doctors couldn't do it because they could have been charged with homicide. So that wow. case went all the way to the New Jersey Supreme Court and the New Jersey Supreme Court determined that they could remove her ventilator that there was no hope of her recovery, that requiring her to continue living in her condition was inhumane, and that her parents, her surrogates, could make the determination that she would not have wanted to continue living. So we saw in the late 60s and early 70s, these sort of legal cases start to emerge where we created this precedent for removing life-sustaining treatment from patients in the case where they would not want to con continue to live. Mm. I, I remember growing up, there was a famous case, uh, Terry Schiavo mm -hmm. in, in New Jersey that made that me was think about that. Florida, actually. Was it Florida? Okay, mm -hmm. yes, I'm incorrect with that. Um, right. And I just remember the, the national discussion that that caused and, and people feel very strongly one way or, or the other. Is there a way for the general public to get involved in, in this kind of a discussion? Well, I think that cases involving 
disorders of consciousness like the vegetative state are one of those situations where the public is really interested yeah. in in what's going on and of course people can have very different views about what the right thing to do is in those cases someone who's in a, a vegetative state as it's called is not terminally ill. That's not a person who is imminently dying. And so removing life-sustaining treatment in those cases usually means removing artificial nutrition and hydration or tube feeding, mm -hmm. which will not result in them dying within minutes or even an hour. That, that does result in a somewhat prolonged death over the course of a week or two. Mm -hmm. And so many people have problems with that as, as a way of withdrawing treatment from these patients. And of course, there are also people who have religious objections to removing something as, as basic as, as feeding a patient or view it as killing a person when you do that. So those cases are very controversial. And the Terry Schiavo case was one of those situations where that all sort of came to a head that you have the, the parents of Ms. Schiavo who did not want to remove life-sustaining treatment and her husband who said, you know, this has been going on now for many years and she's not going to recover and I don't think she would want to continue living this way. Mm -hmm. And we have at this point enough legal precedent, including a case that went all the way to the US Supreme Court saying, you can remove life-sustaining treatment from patients in the vegetative state. So um, the, legally, the, the ground is clear for doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And any adult patient has the right to say, that they don't want a particular type of treatment or they don't want even life-sustaining treatment that they require in order to stay alive. So any adult patient who, who has the mental capacity to make those kinds of decisions can say that. And they can also say it in something like an advanced directive where they say, you know, if I lose consciousness or lose my ability to make decisions for myself, I don't want X, Y, and Z, even if it results in my death. So that's, that's an important right that all patients have. It gets much more controversial when we don't have clear evidence of what someone's wishes might be. And of mm -hmm. course, when we are talking about children or other persons who never had the ability to make those decisions for themselves. Yeah. Oh, man, I appreciate the heaviness of making that decision too. my family experienced that with my grandmother who unfortunately passed away from dementia. And, you know, with dementia, for anyone that doesn't know, you know, your body, or I don't know, the proper medical term being you lose the ability to speak and then you lose the ability to perform certain bodily functions. And, and eventually, you know, she was laying there being fed with a, with a tube and the decision was made to remove it. And, and there was such a heaviness across the family that came with that decision, but also a certain grace that you know, a disease like dementia robs you of so much dignity and, you know, she didn't deserve that. So. Right. And, like and a, dementia, you know, is, is one of those conditions which affects older people, many of whom did have sort of really settled views about how they wanted their lives to end and, mm -hmm. and they didn't want their lives to end in an intensive care unit or in a nursing home or, or yeah. something like that. And of course with a, a sort of, progressive neurodegenerative disease like dementia, the, they're not going to get better, they're only going to get worse. And right. so those are cases where those patients can advance to something like a disorder of consciousness where they eventually lose consciousness. They can also progress to, to brain death as well. But um, that's one of those things that many people have strong views about not wanting to happen in their case. Yeah. Sid, thank you so much for this extremely thought-provoking conversation. I, I know that you write articles based on, you know, what you're studying and, and what you teach your students. Uh, so I'm going to share that link. Uh, but is there somewhere else that, that people can find your work? Google Scholar will list all of my my books and, and journal publications. I also have some publications on, on various bioethics related blogs and, and other places so they can search my name, I think, and come up with some of those things. Great. Yeah. I think people would uh, find a lot of value in doing that. Well, thank you again. Uh, have a great day. Thanks. You too.
Well, as always, thank you so, so, so much for listening. I hope uh, I hope everyone's out there doing well, and and I'll talk to you next week. Well, I'll be back in New York from South Carolina, visiting family. Very excited. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week.